It was a lavish banquet. I brought you back this little doggy bag. It doesn't do it justice, but at least it's a taste. No. Oh. The audiobook version of Daniel Dennett's From Bacteria to Bach and Back, The Evolution of Minds, is 15 hours and 44 minutes long, but it took me a lot longer than that to listen to it. I rewound, re-listened, and returned to dense sections many times over, deepening my understanding with each successive listen. I thoroughly enjoyed the process, but it was work. Work that most of my loved ones just aren't going to do. This video is my attempt to offer those loved ones a taste of the book's big and beautiful insights. It is less of a summary of the book than a summary of my individual experience reading the book. As such, some of the connections, examples, and metaphors I use are Dennett's, but some are my own. Here we go! Humans ask why. Young humans do it obsessively. This is my daughter the other day. She's like, Papa, why can't we go outside? Well, because it's raining. Why? <laughs> well, water's coming out of the sky. <laughs> why? Because it was in a cloud. <laughs> why? Well, clouds form when there's vapor. <laughs> why? I don't know. I don't know. That's I don't know any more things. Those are all the things I know. Why? Cuz I'm stupid, okay? I'm stupid. Why? Well, because I didn't pay attention in school, okay? I went to school but I didn't listen in class. Why? You just keep coming more questions. Why? 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 But there are two different senses of the word why. What for and how come. Imagine you're a teacher and you gave out a test with the question, why are dice cube shaped? I'll give you two of your students' answers. You decide which one to mark correct. Sally writes, dice are cube shaped because the plastic they're made from is melted then injected into a cube shaped mold. Billy writes, dice are cube shaped so that when they're thrown, they have an equal probability of landing any of six ways which makes them useful for a wide variety of games. I think you'd have to mark them both right. Sally and Billy interpreted the why in your question in two different ways. We actually have three different options for explaining things. When we adopt the physical stance like Sally did, we treat whatever is under consideration as matter being acted on by physics. When we adopt the design stance like Billy did, we treat whatever is under consideration as an intelligently designed artifact with a function. The next question on the test is, why are planets spherical? Once again, Sally offers an explanation from the physical stance. Planets are spherical because they're so massive that their gravity pulls all of their material. Yada yada yada. Billy is unable to generate a design stance response because planets are not designed. So he just writes, no reason. How would you mark that? The third stance, which doesn't apply to dice or planets, is the intentional stance. It's a stance we default to when talking about the actions of our fellow humans. We treat the actor as a rational agent. When we ask, what brought you to the library today, Darnell? We're looking for an answer like, oh, I'm looking for a mystery novel that Kate and I can enjoy reading together. Not an answer like, number eight bus. Here come some more questions from your bizarre test paired with Tommy's answers. This time, you don't have to mark them right or wrong. You have to identify which of the three stances Tommy is operating from. Why did Napoleon place his imperial crown on his own head instead of allowing the Pope to do it? To signify that his authority as emperor outstripped the authority of the church. Why are grain silos round? So none of the grain gets lodged in corners and rots. Why do igneous rocks that form underground have bigger crystals than those that form above ground? Since it's warmer down there, the molten rock cools more slowly, so there's more time for free-floating atoms to assemble in larger structures before it all solidifies. Why are lots of aquatic animals dark on the top and light on the bottom? So they're camouflaged, whether viewed from above, where their dark side blends with the dark depths of the ocean, or from below, where their light underbelly blends with the sunlit surface of the sea. Did I stump you? 
Perhaps you're thinking, hold on just a minute, Missy. I thought the design stance was for man-made objects like dice and silos, not for natural things. The design stance can, in fact, be used for the features of living things because they were designed by natural selection. Unclear how natural selection could be a designing force? It's time for a game. I'm going to propose several new imaginary species. For each one, tell me if it would evolve. For this game, a species counts as evolved if all of its members in a generation have a trait that none of its members had in some previous generation. This is Buddy. Buddy replication is perfect. Every buddy always gives birth to two exact duplicates of itself. Will buddies ever evolve? No, because no new traits ever enter the gene pool. This is a cutty. Cutty replication is super random. Each cutty gives birth to two totally different kinds of cutty. This one might give birth to a cutty that looks like a guitar, and one that looks like a mushroom. They in turn might bear children that look like a shrub, a book, an igloo, and a bulldozer. Will cutties ever evolve? No, because even if the bulldozer cutty turns out to be the best cutty ever, somehow able to have four children instead of the standard two, it is no more likely to have a bulldozer cutty for a child than a sandwich cutty. There's no heredity. This is a duddy. Duddy replication is nearly, but not completely, perfect. Most duddies are just like their mother, but some are slightly different. The duddies live in an infinite and beautiful garden with plenty to eat and no predators. They all live exactly three years and have exactly two children. Will duddies ever evolve? No. Because even though there is variation in the population, like this greenish family line, the differences don't make a difference, so they never spread to fixation. This is a fuddy. Like the duddies, fuddies' replication is nearly but not completely perfect. Unlike the duddies, though, the fuddies live alongside a predator species. Guddies gobble them up. As a result, some fuddies live long enough to have two children, some only one, some none at all. Will fuddies ever evolve into a new species? Absolutely. Although it is largely luck which fuddies the guddies gobble, some of the slight variations will make a difference. If slightly greener fuddies are slightly harder for the guddies to see than the yellow ones, they will be slightly more likely to live long enough to have two children, which will cause greenness to spread to fixation. Maybe they'll also evolve speed-boosting superfeet and umbrella shells. <laughs> what is certain is that given millions of years, the fuddy will acquire enough improvements to its design that it merits a new species name. This is a huddy. Evolution is the predictable consequence of any heritable variation in the members of a population that causes differential reproductive success. Natural selection is the collection of generation copying perfectly and testing reproduce as able algorithms that make it happen. Natural selection is also bewildering statement alert an automatic reason finder that tracks reasons for features and behaviors in living things without representing that tracking. That is crazy. It's crazy. No. Let's break that down. Automatic reason finder that tracks reasons for features and behaviors in living things? The dark on the top, light on the bottom coloration evolved in several lineages of aquatic animals independently, but always for the same reason. Whose reason? Not the dolphins, clever as they are, it wasn't their idea, and certainly not the halibuts. The algorithms of natural selection happened on the same good innovation multiple times. Wow. Without representing that tracking? Good computer programmers pepper their code with comments that explain what its various parts do. In C++, text preceded by forward slashes is ignored by the compiler but it's extremely useful for human readers of the source code. Genetic code has no comments. The reason for the coloration isn't written down in the genetic code, or known to a clever dolphin, or understood by natural selection as if natural selection were a thinking thing. It's represented nowhere until a human biologist discovers it. It's a free-floating rationale. A major recurring theme throughout from bacteria to Bach and back is the human tendency to apply the intentional stance too liberally, tacitly assuming rational agency where we maybe shouldn't. One example is Beatrix Potter syndrome, the belief that animals must think the same way we do. New game!
We're going to consider three bird behaviors. I'll offer a design stance explanation and an intentional stance explanation for each one, and you say which is the better fit. Cuckoos are brood parasites. The mother cuckoo lays her egg in a nest built by another species, in this case a reed warbler. When it hatches, the baby cuckoo pushes all of the other eggs out of the nest. Why? Design stance answer. Rolling away any round objects in its vicinity works out well for the newborn cuckoo because it ensures the cuckoo gets all the food his stepmother bird brings to the nest. Intentional stance answer. The cuckoo wants to get all the food his stepmother bird brings to the nest and knows that by callously murdering his step siblings before they hatch, he'll never have to share with them. The intentional stance is ridiculous here because it assumes that a baby bird whose eyes haven't even opened understands that the other eggs, if let be, would produce other baby birds. It's possible, I guess, since he did come out of an egg. But it also assumes he has a concept of division of finite resources. It's much more likely that the cuckoo acts on instinct and doesn't know the reason for his actions. There is a rationale, but it isn't his. It's free-floating. <coughs> Plovers lay their nests on the ground. If a fox or other predator is approaching the nest, the plover will flop around as if it has a broken wing while moving away from the nest. The fox will pursue the injured-looking plover, following it far away from the eggs. Then the plover flies away. Intentional stance explanation. The plover thinks, that fox is going to eat my eggs if I don't do something. I'll pretend to be hurt. He'll think I'm an easy meal and chase me. I'll lure him far away from here. Design stance explanation. Having a broken wing display reflex works out well for the plover because foxes have a chase any flopping bird reflex. The intentional stance initially struck me as the more reasonable of the two, but then I remembered that Psych 101 chestnut, the unexpected contents task. What do you think is inside this box? Let's open it up and see. Candles. Now, you can ask the child what appears to be a very simple question about that. What did you think was inside the box when you first saw it? They say, oh, I always thought that there were candles in this box. Then you can ask them about someone else. So you can ask them about Snoopy. Snoopy's been sitting here. He hasn't seen this box. He's never seen us open it up. What does Snoopy think is inside this box? Uh, candles. Children say the same thing. Snoopy will think there are candles inside of this box. And what that indicates is that the children's view of how minds work is very, very different from the view that you and I would have. If a human three-year-old can't quite comprehend that others don't know what he knows, is it really likely that a plover can comprehend that if she fakes a wing injury, the fox won't know she's not faking and therefore she can exploit the fox's false belief? More likely, the plover is demonstrating competence without comprehension, a fabulous talent she has but doesn't understand. A wild crow drops hard nuts onto a busy street with a pedestrian crosswalk. Cars drive over the nuts and crack them open. She perches, attentively watching the walk-don't-walk walk sign, waits for it to change, then swoops down to collect the nuts when the traffic is stopped. This and other amazing feats of corvids definitely demonstrate some kind of comprehension, doesn't it? This time, instead of asking you to pick between two stances, I'm going to introduce Dennett's four-level model of comprehension. You pick where the crow fits. Darwinian creatures are born knowing all they will ever know. Skinnerian creatures randomly generate new behaviors to check for whether they produce pleasure or pain. They have some optionality. They can repeat the behaviors they've learned cause pleasure and refrain from the behaviors they've learned cause pain. Popperian creatures observe the world and learn some important things about how it works. They test out ideas in their brain first, creating forward-looking models. Gregorian creatures use thinking tools, oral language, reading, writing, arithmetic, systemic exploration of ideas, science, microscopes, to think about thinking. To quote Bo Dalbaum, you can't do much carpentry with your bare hands, and you can't do much thinking with your bare brain. To quote Rudolf Carnap, Anything you can do, I can do meta. <coughs> Crows are paparian creatures. They possess some know-how comprehension. Humans are the only Gregorian creatures. Human comprehension adds not just the ability to communicate know-how, but the ability to represent what is under consideration explicitly using words and diagrams. And now the juicy question. 
Which of the four types of creatures have consciousness? I used to lose sleep over where in our line of ancestors consciousness arose. The first human? The first mammal? The first vertebrate? The first eukaryote? Which one? Which one? Which one? But the idea that there was a first conscious creature reeks of pre-Darwinian essentialism. There wasn't even really a first mammal. You can draw your clade starting at this little Archaeothyrus, or her mother, or her grandmother, or her daughter, or her granddaughter. The transition is too smooth to justify one over the other. Perhaps consciousness too admits of degrees. The Popperian crow's inner workshop for problem solving is sort of consciousness, but even a lobster has a strong enough sense of self that if he's in a heap with other lobsters, he'll claw their legs off but never his own. That's sort of consciousness too. Consciousness, then, may be just too messy of a concept for this point in the video. Why does everything go so lumpy? Tell you what, chuck it out and we'll start again. Humans converse, cook, compose, collaborate, contemplate, and calculate. Since we have all these competences that other animals lack, it's somewhat surprising that there isn't an immediately obvious structure in our brain, absent in the brains of our closest cousins, that we can point to and say, there's the humanity machine. But consider two computers, identical in hardware. Using computer A, you find the internet full of functionality. You can video chat, play games, learn anything. Using computer B, you find the internet full of error messages. <coughs> Computer A does have a machine Computer B lacks, a Java virtual machine. You can't point to it because it is virtual, but it makes a difference. It enables Computer A to run the dizzying diversity of Java applets that give the internet its versatility. Here's a fact. I'm the only one of these clowns that can code in Java, and I write sleek, performant, low-overhead Scala code with higher-order functions that will run on anything. Period. End of sentence. What is the virtual machine installed in human brains that chimpanzee brains lack, which allows us to perform the dizzying diversity of mental feats that give our species its versatility? <laughs> Language! We English speakers have an EVM, an English virtual machine, that can run any English book, sermon, ad, or conversation it encounters. Chinese speakers have a CVM that runs any Chinese book, sermon, ad, or conversation it encounters. Content that to my brain is just meaningless noise. How does a language machine get installed in the brain of a developing child? Infants attend to speech sounds made by the humans around them <laughs> and babble, producing their own speech sounds. They possess a built-in skill for recognizing regularities in the chaotic jumble, making associations between particular sounds and particular people and objects, until eventually they have a vocabulary of words with meanings they comprehend, which they can draw from ad hoc. What is unclear is the extent to which this built-in skill is specifically a language acquisition instinct, distinct from our general pattern detection instinct. What general pattern detection instinct? It's time to consider the Bayesian model of the brain. When I enter Once Upon a into the text messaging program on my phone, it offers up three candidate words I may wish to use next. It doesn't know why those words are likely to follow Once Upon a. It doesn't know that Once Upon a Time is a classic opening line for fairy tales. Once Upon a Time. I wish in a far off kingdom. Or that Once Upon a Capital T Time is a hit television program somehow on its seventh season. Or that Once Upon a Dream is a lilting song from the film Sleeping Beauty. I know you, I walked with you once upon a dream. Those rationales are just free-floating. All the text messaging system knows is that of the millions of instances of the word a uh in the database it consults, those preceded by Once Upon are often succeeded by Time or Dream. The real brilliance of the machine learning algorithms of the new AI, though, is what happens next. Whatever word I type will give a little tiny tug on the enormous network of probabilistic associations. I choose to write walrus. From this day forward, the program will deem once upon a walrus a slightly more probable sequence than it previously did. A Bayesian brain continuously creates probabilistic predictions. When what actually happens matches its expectations, its existing associations are merely strengthened. 
When something unexpected happens, the brain seriously learns, rewriting its expectations and building new associations. Sesame seeds. Cicadas. New game! I'm going to quickly rattle off 10 phenomena that seem to me to click really well with a Bayesian model of the brain. Give a thumbs up if they click for you, too, and a thumbs down if they don't. 1. How when you've practiced something a lot, you can do it really fast. There's antimony, arsenic, aluminum, selenium, and hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and rhenium. 2. How the cleverest kids in class always seem to be one step ahead of the lesson. 3. How when you're doing something routine, like driving home from work your regular way, your brain seems to turn off. 4. How when you want that brain turned off feeling, you gravitate to predictable movies and TV. 5. How the nerves in the brain form a hyperconnected network. 6. How in that network there are more downward than upward pathways. 7. How great teachers often begin lessons with a party trick or something else that surprises the students. 8. How, when we watch a cartoon, our brain patches together still images into the illusion of movement. 9. How, as Hume noted, we only see sequences, A, then B, but our brain assigns causality. A causes B. 10. How bizarre dreams, our sleep brain's free associations, resemble the autocomplete poems my brother and I like to send each other by taking whatever suggestions the text messaging program offers. So here's the pickle. Language is extremely useful. It allows you to communicate novel insights, even about things that aren't physically present. If learning language, learning, for example, to associate the spoken word TV with the glowing box in the corner of the living room, is for a Bayesian brain the same kind of task as developing an association between a ringing bell and a food reward, then why doesn't every dog who lives in the same home as a baby and is exposed to the same number of words as that baby also learn the language? Yes, that's a real pickle. Any account of how prehistoric humans got language must include thresholds that explain why other species didn't get it. There are two ways we can frame the question. We can ask, what features did early hominids have that other life forms don't have that primed them to master language? Or we can ask, what features of early hominids made them more susceptible than other life forms to invasion by words and other parasitic brain viruses? The latter is the meme's eye view. Words and other elements of culture are replicators that live in us and spread through us. Which one spread most has very little to do with how they affect our genetic fitness and a lot to do with their own intrinsic mimetic fitness. Game time! You have 10 seconds to name 9 good friends that you've had over the course of your life. Begin. Now you have 10 seconds to name nine reindeer who live at the North Pole. Begin. Which was easier? Your friends are doubtlessly more important to you than Santa's reindeer, but their names didn't really rattle off the tongue like Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Donner, Blitzen. And here's a humbling thought. Your great-grandchildren will likely have never heard of any of your friends, but they'll probably be able to name all the reindeer, too. The reindeer name sequence is a catchy and persistent meme because it has internal rhyme. It's often included in a larger poem. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen. Or set to music. You know, this Dasher and Dancer and Prancer and Vixen. And Tonner and Blitzen. And our culture's Christmas traditions of carolers and radios and shopping malls ensure you hear it at least once a year. Human brains are good hosts for memes like the reindeer sequence because of our tendency to carefully watch and mimic each other. That bright eyes is remarkable. He keeps trying to form words. You know what they say, human see, human do. One way we align our attention and intention with our fellow humans is by gaze monitoring. 
The whiteness of the whites of our eyes, in contrast to the dark sclera of other primates, is a physical adaptation that probably evolved concurrently with our first forays into language. Why? Because sophisticated communication isn't just about words. It's about tone, gestures, and facial expressions. 90% of what you're saying ain't coming out of your mouth. It's notable that when we create anthropomorphic cartoon animals and imbue them with human language and rationality, uh, watch up, Doc. we also tend to give them white sclera. You dad me! Okay. Get up, huh? get up! Time for school, time for school, time for school, time for school! Oh, I'm up, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, whoa! The interesting thing about gestures and facial expressions is that even though they're a huge part of our communication, we normally produce and interpret them unconsciously. What kind of people consciously monitor their own body language? Salesmen, pickup artists, actors, and other liars and creeps. See if this guy weirds you out. Showing emotion. Now this is a big one. There are times when you need to let the, the tenderness come through. And the one that you want to use here is the open hand, fingers spread apart, and it's the touch to the lower neck chest area. Oh, I'm so sorry for your loss. Or, oh, it means so much to me. If you really want to get heartfelt, use this big sweeping motion right there. And now for a theory that will stretch your imagination beyond its regular limits. When early humans began to speak, they communicated using words they didn't consciously choose and weren't consciously aware of saying. The same way we communicate using facial expressions that we didn't consciously choose and aren't consciously aware of putting on our faces. Something, isn't it? Yes, it is. Think it's impossible to speak before you think? I do it every day. Recently, I've started buying two or three grocery items every day instead of doing a weekly grocery haul. It's a nice walk and my load never gets too heavy. The only trick is that I've got to use my credit card now instead of my debit card to avoid a bank fee for too many debit transactions in a month. Now, every day a cashier tells me my total and I say, debit please! No wait, uh, actually Visa. I've said a cheery, debit please! every time a cashier has told me my bill for over a decade, so it's become automatic. I don't know how I'll crack the habit. Human culture and language evolved over the millennia, and individual humans gradually demonstrated more comprehension and more top-down control of their verbal and creative output. We never did, however, become the perfectly rational robots of GeoFAI, good old-fashioned artificial intelligence. I understand that Arcaria has some very interesting weather patterns. Mr. Data, are you all right? Yes, sir. I am attempting to fill a silent moment with non-relevant conversation. Small talk. Yes, sir. I have found that humans often use small talk during awkward moments. Therefore, I have written a new subroutine for that purpose. We humans have a very generous tendency to retrospectively declare anything humans have done as having been done with more foresight and intention than was probably the case. I meant to do that. Art appreciators identify the features of great works that make them so effective. It is often unclear, however, if the reasons they uncover are the artist's reasons, and therefore the intentional stance is appropriate, or if they are free-floating rationales and a design stance is appropriate. Game time! You're going to see part of a video explaining what's great about Diego Velázquez's painting Les Maninas. Hold up your left hand whenever you think the particular reason being toted is something Velázquez chose consciously. Hold up your right hand when you think the reason being toted is something Velázquez did simply because he liked it that way. The reason for its brilliance only being identified later by art historians. You have here a real clinic in composing group scenes. What Velasquez has done in this group of 11, including the mirror images of the king and queen, is arranged an extraordinary number of links and contrasts that slides your eyes back and forth across the canvas. The first thing to notice, perhaps, is the obsession here with grouping twos and threes. Everyone here but the princess can be split into pairs, the male and female dwarf, the two chaperones here, the curtsying maid and the palace official in the back corridor, the king and the queen in the mirror, and Velasquez and the maid kneeling to offer the princess a drink. Notice also that these are all male-female pairs, and these pairings accentuate the princess as the focus of the scene. 
But you could also split the group up into threes. The princess with her two maids, the dog and the two dwarves, and the two palace officials with what now occurs to us are mirrored couples. See also that these two groups of three, internally made up of doubles and triples, are all on the same horizontal plane. This group of six also draws the entirety of the painting's three-dimensional space. Our eye is drawn from Velasquez in the foreground to the palace official in the distance as they're wearing similar black garb and stand in line with the two doorways on the back walls. The chaperones in the middle ground link to the king and queen in the background, which simultaneously brings the z-axis all the way forward beyond the picture itself, intimating a depth that we can't even see. It's amazing. What you might not have realized is that this motif of twos and threes has already been established in the frames on the back wall, with two giant canvases over top two door frames and the central mirror. Of that bottom triple, the right sides of the frames correspond with the princess and her two maids, moving the eyes naturally from the king and queen to their daughter. But the eyes are also drawn from the mirror to the right, that lighted passage framing the palace official. The space of this lighted rectangle is equal to that of the mirror, and they're put on the same horizontal plane as well. Indeed, because of its brightness, like the brightness of the little princess bathed in light, we're drawn to it just as much as the other two. In these three elements of Las Meninas, we have three central focus points. If master strokes by great artists can be attributed in part to uncomprehending competence, then the design stance, not the intentional stance, should be our default position for considering the great early cultural innovations like writing, money, clocks, and calendars. They were not the brain children of ancient rogue geniuses, but clumsy collaborative stabs in the dark. The free-floating rationales for the innovations which academics discovered after the fact are true, but the inventors didn't have those reasons. For example, you learn in Economics 101 that money is a medium of exchange which eliminates the need for a double coincidence of wants implicit in a barter system. But no ancient human ever said, wouldn't it be great if Oot would trade me one of his sheep even though he doesn't want my wheat? Maybe I could convince everyone in the village to agree to always accept bricks in trade, whether they're building a house presently or not. Then I could give a brick to Oot, and he could use it to get whatever he wants, whether that's some of Nana's ore or some of Unga's wood. Never happened. In fact, money actually preceded barter systems. Counterintuitive? Folk wisdom often doesn't match reality. The time has come for me to describe one of my favorite philosophical concepts. My friends and family will recall that long ago I sketched out a story of a little boy named Buck who decides to write a list of everything that exists. Do you happen to recall the name of that story? Buck's Ontology. Every person has an ontology, and it simply is all the things he believes exist. Not all ontologies are identical. Some of us believe in the tooth fairy, some don't. But there's a huge amount of overlap. In our society, sunflowers, baseballs, the color orange, and a million other things are in just about everybody's ontology. They comprise a shared picture of the world that we can all reference when talking to each other, the manifest image. Depending how much education you've received in science, there may be some additional items in your ontology, viruses, black holes, and magnetic fields. Educated people have a shared picture of the world populated with those items, the scientific image. The manifest image and the scientific image often conflict. Does the color orange exist? In the manifest image, yes, absolutely and simply. Orange is orange. In the scientific image, though, it's more complicated. Electromagnetic radiation with a wavelength of 590 to 620 nanometers at a frequency of between 484 and 508 terahertz exists. If that stuff gets in your eyes, your brain interprets it as orange. More generally, the folk belief of the manifest image is that our brain is trustworthy. What we think we see and hear and feel is, in fact, the real world. In the scientific image, our brain is like this video. It presents a reorganized, simplified approximation of the real world with some of its own stuff added in. We've already seen that it's not quite true to say roses are red, violets are blue. But what about sugar is sweet? Really, the only word for it is... Homer's right. 
We notably can't describe in words our experience of sweetness, but we know it isn't in the sugar any more than a scream is in a desk drawer. It isn't a feature of glucose, it's our reaction to it. What's happening? I can't hear and I'm dying! If color and sweetness are illusions generated by our brains, could consciousness itself be an illusion? If you look at a living brain, you can't see the memories or other semantic information it holds, any more than you can see what programs are installed in a working computer by looking at the CPU. Fortunately, computers have monitors that display graphic user interfaces. The file folders on your desktop map onto the actual architecture of the information in your CPU only very loosely. It's a misrepresentation intelligently designed to be user-friendly for the humans who want to access the information in the CPU. Consciousness evolved not primarily for the person with the consciousness, but so other humans could get at the information stored in that person's brain. Early human B just returned from the other side of the hill. Early human A wants to access the semantic information that human B acquired there and save himself the trip. That there's a spring, that there's a snake. If they could do some kind of direct information transfer, they wouldn't need language. Our minds, one and together. Human B wouldn't even need, and this is the wild part, a theater of recall. He wouldn't own in his ontology a word snake or even a mental picture of a snake. He wouldn't need any stream of consciousness or any mental pictures at all. He would just have the learned fact there is a snake on the log by the spring over the hill as raw information. Humans can't mind meld though, so human B needs a consciousness, a user illusion that makes his competences accessible to human A, who can't know and doesn't need to know how human B's brain actually works, just like most computer users have no idea how those actually work. That human B can also internally use his consciousness to access the word and picture process versions of the semantic information in his brain is just a side benefit. Minds aren't exactly like computers, of course. The most important difference is that a computer is a Marxist worker's paradise, and the brain is dog-eat-dog -dog capitalism. Each circuit in a computer is identical to all its mass-produced comrades. Every neuron is utterly unique. In a computer, the data crunching work and the power supply to do it with is distributed fairly to every whirring servo. In a brain, each neuron must compete to make itself useful and get itself fed. Every day, thousands of your less connected neurons die, outcompeted. <coughs> An escaped domestic pig can go feral within just a few months, growing thick hair and tusks and becoming as fierce as its wild boar ancestors. The genes for gentleness, carefully cultivated by human breeders over the generations, switch off, unleashing the beast within. The competitive ferocity of our neurons harkens back to the single-celled organisms from which they evolved. It is as if some of the genes for quietly existing as part of a multicellular life form have been turned off, and they too are returning to their wild roots. It may be the feral neurons in our brain that allow us our biggest advantage over computers, that aforementioned side benefit of being able to access our own user illusion and think consciousness. That conscious thinking isn't the only thinking we do, but it's the only thinking we can be aware of doing. So when you find someone staring off into space, thinking but not aware of what they're thinking about, take a good look at them before they snap out of it. That's someone accessing raw information the good old-fashioned way our ancestors did before memes took over our brains. This concludes my summary of my individual experience reading Daniel Dennett's From Bacteria to Bach and Back. Remember, some of what's in the video isn't directly in the book. It's my slant on things. So in the comments section, Please direct any praise of the ideas to Daniel Dennett, but any criticism of them to me, because I may have misrepresented his ideas. What do I know? I'm just a housewife from small town Saskatchewan. Thanks for watching.